Every year, America throws away six and a half billion dollars worth of recyclable goods like paper, aluminum, and plastic. And the household recycling that gets mixed up in blue bins costs hundreds of millions of dollars to sort. That job can be dangerous. Things like dirty diapers, surfboards, televisions, even hand grenades come through fairly regularly. Now, a growing number of companies have deployed AI and robotics to help make recycling safer and more efficient. Matanya Horowitz, founder of the robotics company AMP, spent six years perfecting his trash handling robots. This little robot right over here, it's just a valve. It just uses a little piston and kind of flicks things off from the side. We went to AMP's biggest recycling plant in Cleveland, Ohio, to see if AI can help fix recycling. The U.S. is one of the world's biggest waste producers and only recycles about a third of its eligible trash. That's much lower than other countries like South Korea and Germany, which recycle more than half of their garbage. In America, waste management is a local issue. The country has over 9,000 different recycling programs, making it difficult to standardize at scale. As a result, U.S. recycling varies greatly by state. Today, California and Oregon have the highest residential recycling rates in the U.S. at 37 percent, while Mississippi and Louisiana have the lowest at 8 percent. For decades, the U.S. could rely on countries like China to buy mostly unprocessed trash. From 1992 to 2017, the U.S. exported $11 billion worth of recyclable waste to China, largely unsorted. But in 2017, China said it no longer wanted to import contaminated materials like plastics and paper products. As a result, U.S. facilities had fewer places to sell their recyclables, and many struggled to turn a profit. Facing steep costs, many sent their waste to landfills or incinerators. These challenges created an opportunity for robotics companies like AMP, which Matanya founded in 2014. There's value in the plastics, there's value in the aluminum, but the problem has been that you needed all of these manual sorters to pull that material out, and there's a lot of cost associated with that. And you're left with this kind of marginal business. At its start, AMP put its own trash sorting robotics in other recycling facilities. In 2022, the company began operating its flagship facility in Cleveland, Ohio. This AMP One facility, as it's called, runs on AMP machinery and software. A big part of what we do is focused on making that automated, making it so people don't have to touch garbage, and also making it so that this technology can sort through dirtier and dirtier material streams. So you can require less of consumers and really um, have a solution that is pervasive. The facility gets its waste from plastic manufacturers and materials recovery facilities, or MRFs, that have earmarked these bales for landfill. For most of America's recyclables, this is their only chance to avoid being sent to the dump. Dozens of workers use specialized machines like trommels and screens to sort trash. MRFs can sort roughly 87% of the materials they receive. But workers can be exposed to sharp objects like used syringes and batteries or aerosol cans that can explode. AMP's plant in Cleveland has 15 employees and they rarely touch garbage. Instead, a fleet of cameras and air jets get the trash sorted. Kevin Papage's job is to make sure AMP's automated plants are running smoothly. We view this building as an entire robot. There's very little hands-on sortation that takes place in this facility. Mostly, we're maintaining the line, keeping the place orderly, and producing quality bales. Up to 10 trucks arrive daily dropping off a total of about 200 tons of mixed recyclables. It all arrives in giant 1,500-pound bales. Forklift operators drop them into a reducer, which breaks them apart with metal teeth. The material we get in this facility comes from the eastern half of the United States. We receive material as far away as Iowa and Alabama and Florida. Cliff, you copy. Cliff. Go for Cliff. Full line start. After the bales are broken, they come through the sortation line. The first step is the ferrous offtake. A rotary magnet pulls iron-based metals off the line. 
We get bailing wire, car parts, food cans, that sort of stuff. Next, air jets blow away paper scraps and flexible packaging, like the thin, clear plastic that's wrapped around food and toys. AMPS jets can sort thousands of recyclables a minute, more than 10 times the amount its robotic arms can. Any remaining materials travel along these belts, passing under cameras that ID and track them using AMP's custom-made deep learning neural network. This network uses multiple layers of nodes, like neurons in the human brain. These nodes work together to analyze patterns like textures and shapes to ID specific material. AMP scans more than 50 billion objects a year. The more it scans, the more it learns. We're focused on a system that you're not really programming so much as teaching. You can teach them how to identify number one plastics, even though they're smashed and folded and dirty and inconsistent. And with that, you essentially have a garbage sensor. And that garbage sensor is what the industry has been missing. AMP's system can also target specific materials and colors. We've had somebody come to us and say, hey, I didn't know you could sort color. Can you give me just clear and natural polypropylene? And we were able to do that by just adjusting the neural net and giving them that bail. Because everything is tracked, the plant can detect problems on the line. So pretty much every corner of the facility is being monitored for quality, for contingencies, like is a jam forming? Is there material where it's not supposed to be? Eventually, AMP's trash gets to the recirculating line, a belt that moves missed material back into the sortation line. We're currently capturing 85 to 90 percent of all the product we send through the line. Once the materials are sorted, they fall into their own bunkers. From there, those bunkers are emptied and then moved to the baler operation, where we can actually bale each unique commodity and then goes into finished goods for sale. Bales of recyclable plastics get more valuable the better they're sorted. The higher the purity, the higher the price. We're always geared up for 90 plus percent purity inside of our bales, and I think we hit that 100 percent of the time. AMP sells those bales to other recycling mills, which use them to make plastic bottles, aluminum cans, and car parts. The company also sells its tech to other recyclers. Today, its systems support nearly 100 facilities around the world. But AMP's machines can't ID every piece of trash. This is where AI still needs an assist from humans. Images of mist material are sent to a team of human annotators in India, who identify and label them in the neural net to train the AI. Human annotators are going through that data, looking for mistakes. We are also always getting more specific about what we identify. So at first, it was enough to say that this was a number one plastic. Now we say, oh, we also want to know what color it is, what form factor it is, and what brand it is. The company says its AI-trained machines and leaner workforce help make AMP ones up to 50% cheaper to run than traditional MRFs. It also runs an R&D lab in Denver, where the team studies information gathered by its hundreds of sorting devices around the world. They're all uploading data to this cloud infrastructure we've built. We then have people go through that data set and say, here's what's number one plastics, here's aluminum cans, and everything else. Joe Castagneri leads AMP's software development. The video feed is coming in, it's received in the computer, and we pass it through the brain of uh, AMP's system, which is the neural network, which is looking at those images, trying to figure out what those things are. These green outlines are for natural high-density polyethylene. There's also an aluminum can under there. But making sure these computers work under real-life conditions is a challenge. You have to get it to work in a hot, dusty, trash-filled environment that's 80 degrees or 40 degrees. The company says it has buyers for all the waste that flows through the AMP1 facility in Cleveland, but it has trouble selling waste at some of its other facilities. The real challenge is there are a lot of materials we can recycle where there isn't what we call an end market. There isn't somebody who will buy it and use it. Number one plastics that's colored, almost nobody wants. We can sort it out all day, nobody will buy it, and it means that we sort it out and it just goes right to the landfill anyway. Part of the problem is that making new plastic is often cheaper than recycling it, especially when oil prices are low. Some U.S. states have passed Extended Producer Responsibility Laws, or EPRs, that hold manufacturers accountable for the waste they create. 
Right now, five U.S. states have passed EPR laws targeting packaging waste. Broadly, I think these rules are important and they're good, but I worry that people are going to think that incremental improvements are good enough. People should be aiming for doubling the diversion rates that they have now, and they should be aiming for it to do that in the next several years. And it's possible. It's possible with technology like ours. It's possible with other technology. For now, he's focused on growing AMP's facilities and getting its tech in more recycling centers around the world. If we can make recycling and waste management a more profitable business, we can make waste management infrastructure spread across the world more quickly, and we can get, stop having plastics in the ocean and things like that. So when you look at these huge global problems and you see how recycling can become a solution to them, it's very exciting and very motivating. The hardest part of the job, it is not the robots. Ha, 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 ha.